studios in New York City. This is Charlie Rose. Filmmaker Rebecca Miller and Academy Award winner Daniel Day-Lewis are here. The Ballad of Jack and Rose is her third film. It is also the first time the husband and wife have worked together. Here is the trailer for the film. What are you thinking about? I think I want to plant the bell flowers in front of the house today. You're getting freckles. I always had those. somebody in to help. Who? A maid? She'll take care I of things. I took care of well, things. We took care of things. Now I'm sick. Come live with me. My kid needs a woman around the place, and so do I. What about my kids? Well, that goes without saying. Does anybody else live out here? Uh, it used to be a commune. 60 people living here, give or take, at one time. We're trying to rebuild society on a small scale. It was an experiment. It looks like it didn't go too well. How long do you stay here? Not very long, personally. I put a spell on you. But I have a feeling that my mother will be embedded here for quite some time. Because you're mine. Does your dad know about this place? Maybe. Does he know everything about you? Who are you people? <laughs> what the hell's going on with you? Well, Rose is the way you made her. I've made a mess of a lot of things in my life. I don't have time to pay for them. You should never have let the world down. I wish it could be just us like it was before. I just said, who does, tra who does trailers? And you said, some mysterious person that you never know. Yeah. Uh, you wrote the script for this? Yes. Now, tell me about it. I mean, what's the story, and how did you come to want to tell this story? Well, uh, I started really with two characters that, that I inherited from my previous script, the script for Angela, uh, my first film, uh, a father and a daughter. And in that film, at the end of that film, there there's a six-year-old girl and her father really left to the story and I thought what happens in ten years what would their relationship be like and so on very rapidly those two characters became completely different and ended up living on an abandoned commune on an island and uh, these characters emerged you know the the people that come to visit them and to, in their lives and kind of turn their lives upside down so um, I really just I always start with character and then see where it leads me and tell me about Rose Rose is a girl who's been completely sheltered in her life by her father. She hasn't really gone to school. She's been homeschooled. She's innocent of television and all material things, really. But she knows how to run a commune, <laughs> I mean, a, a farm. And, um, uh, but as the movie unfolds, she becomes increasing. You see that she has a tremendous will, a very strong will, and a very, very strong character. She basically expresses herself through action not through words. And the actress is Camille Bell? Camille Bell, yeah. You know, and where did you find her? Um, we, we read 400 actresses for the part and rapidly it became clear that really five or six of them were real possibilities and then Daniel read with those yeah. and so we narrowed it down to three and then clearly Camila really came out. It, it was very clear that she had the innocence she had the, she, she looked like she could be related to Daniel, but also she had this tremendous innocence and a sense of being untouched in a way, which is very unusual in adolescence at this point, at this time. And uh, also she was a very good actress, of course. And, and, to, and for Jack. <laughs> and for Jack. Did you, did you say, I want the best actor I can find? 
Yes, I and, did. And where do I find And I turned around, and there he was. <laughs> you, turned, you turned over, and there he was. In his rocking chair. In his rocking chair. <laughs> on, on hiatus. <laughs> yeah. Right. It, what happened? I mean, you had not worked together before. No, did you we had you always wanted to work together before, and then all, all of a sudden you looked at the script and you said... Yeah. Well, I had gotten... I oh, had, did you write it for you him know, in mind? No. I mean, the story really is that I had written the script with no one in mind, just inventing the character of Jack. And about when I felt I had a real draft, I sent it to Daniel without knowing him. Um, just thinking he was the best actor I could think of. And I sent it to him. And he sent me back a very sweet note saying how taken he was with the script, but that he wasn't quite uh, prepared to do it that he was really interested by it. And he felt making shoes. I was, yeah, something. And, um, and then we later met. Subsequently, we met, and um, <clears throat> we got married and had kids. And then, so is that how you got, you got met, and the next day you got married, and the next day you had kids? It's yeah, sort of, that's what it feels like, like looking back on it right now. You now. met when, what, he was doing The Crucible? He, afterwards. Afterwards, yeah. yeah. Um, afterwards. And... Uh, yeah, and then and then IFC after I made Personal Velocity, which was my last film, I had IFC gave me the opportunity to make uh, the Ballad of Jack and Rose without a cast attached, which I was oh. very grateful for and will always be loyal to them because of that. And um, so I went back to Daniel and I said, <laughs> I, I didn't think he was. I thought he would take some more time off yeah. um, from Gangs of New York, but I did say, you know, you're my first choice. So before I go running around. Um, to anybody else, I want you to know that, and, and he is thought after about you it. Were married. Oh well, uh, yeah, we've yeah, been married right. for years. And, and did you have apprehension? I did, yeah. Um, different one because by this time, I felt the 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 gravity of her story ha had become somehow irresistible. I felt the pull of it when I first read it, and I found well, all the characters immediately very compelling. It was beautifully written. And very unusual, quite eccentric in a certain way that appealed to me. And, but, uh, but this time, I don't know, I just didn't feel able for it at that time. This, on this, when she, you know, you know, on this occasion when, when she asked me, it, I, I could sort of feel that sense of foreboding, you know, that there was no way around this thing. But I also knew that we were taking on something um, very particular in trying to tell this story. Um, between the two of us, whether I just knew that that would somehow, you know, it was a risk, but um, we took right. it. It did. A it did risk. I, oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think all films sort of accelerate the aging process. <laughs> this one, no more particularly than others, but but um, as it turned out, it was tremendously easy uh, in in. Most of the apprehensions we had, I think, were kind of scattered to the winds very quickly. Um, but undoubtedly, there is a, there's a huge amount of pressure involved and, on two people in the same family, engaged in the same kind of insanity for that. Is this something you'd like to do again, work together? Yeah, very much so. Really? Yeah. Both of you, sir? I would love to, yeah. yeah. It was wonderful, because when you, when you do something like this, you get obsessed with it, a film. You know, and it's nice to be obsessed with the same thing. Obsession is his middle name. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, That's true. <laughs> Steady. <laughs> Easy boy. Ah. <laughs> no, but I mean, he's, he's into his work. He is. He is. Now, you, you, when you were making this film, you did not, you lived apart, didn't you? In a certain way, I mean, I had a shack on the, on the waterfront about two miles down, uh, down the coastline from, from the set. And I kind of repaired to that during the week. And, but I mean, I'd come back after the day's shoot, I'd come back and, and to where Rebecca and the kids were and spend some time there and then go off to my little Chase, but it, that seemed to that seemed to work out well. It was just really to retain a sense of isolation, which is always so hard to find on a movie set. Yeah. <laughs> and um, that's important to you. Well, it was certainly important to this story. Yeah, it was it was vital. It was central to it yeah. to have that sense of isolation, and for the two characters. Because too. this is a man who is dying, or because the isolation that he had created for himself with his daughter was. More so that, I think, yeah. More so, more so that. Um, just this, is about a mother, a so, this is about a father and his daughter. This is what this story is about. Hmm. And what else? 
Well, a number of other things. I mean, the love between them, because, because uh, Jack had almost willfully uh, protected her um, from all the influences. After the commune evaporated and everybody went their separate ways, they, w they were left there, the two of them. And he had, I think from that moment on, had tried to raise her in his own image and with this sort of back to the wall mentality, you know, the, uh, the notion that, that, that we were under siege and that... Yeah. This uh, is the whole commune thing. Right, and, and the, 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 the idea that the kind of the, that the, uh, this developing world is gradually eating into yeah. our wilderness. And um, so protecting her from everything that at that stage in her life she should be measuring herself against and, and she should be uh, growing into an understanding of herself in relation to all those things that in a way Jack has deprived her of. But added to that, because they've ripped out all the signposts and are living in this, in this unusual uh, isolation, the love between them begins to kind of flow across the dangerous borderlines of what a parent and child should should um explain that to me i mean why does it come to that because well it comes to that i think because in the natural course of things that love which is uh, the most powerful thing of all in anybody's life but is somehow moderated by um in, in almost every case is moderated not just by a sense of propriety but by a sense of what yeah. of the order of things right. of, the, of, the, of how nature works and has to work um, even that even on a primal level goes beyond the sense of ethics I think but but in their case they Jack of course he is he is neglected his primary responsibility, which is to guide her. She can't see, he's raised her in such a way that she can't see the danger mm. that lies there. And she has a tremendous will and she's encouraging him to enter further and further into this, into this deep love that they have. And he finds himself, I think, both mentally and spiritually less and less able to resist. Mm. And, and how do you handle this in terms of telling your story and in terms of the audience? Well, a powerful idea. You know, f <clears throat> to me, I'm telling a very ancient story, and also, um, but at the same time, a story that belongs in a way to everyone in the audience, in my mind, in the sense that it's really a story about a family, about family, about connections in a family. These people go further down a path that's the, that's the story of a family. These, the, uh, her, also her, um, you know, for me, Rose's journey is, all, is in a way, a, a journey that's independent of the relationship to Jack and Rose, or rather, it, 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 it's almost a, a, another story as well, the way in which she becomes a separate person from him and ultimately sort of survives because of it. But were you worried, I mean, that, that this that an audience might recoil from this at all? Well, you know, I, I had to, to think that I mean, it might happen. It jumps out as incest, as you know. Right, but to me, it's not an incestuous it's not either, relationship. But it, nevertheless, that's... Um, and worried isn't the word. I mean, if I was really worried, I would never make sure. films of, 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 that were, in a way, a, a risk or told an extreme story. To me, these are people, and there's, you know, there's enormous beauty in the love that Jack and Rose have for each other, and it's really a kind of protective and kind of complete um, love that they have. That, uh, so, um, the feeling that I've gotten from most of the people who see the film is that they end up understanding this world that they enter, you know? And uh, that's the main point, is to allow them to do that. Yeah, I, don't, I don't feel as if it's, it's not that the danger is that, is that they're going to, there's going to be a physical right, transgression. Right, right, right. I think the danger is that she's going to be consumed by a love that he should be helping her to separate herself. Yeah. She's going to be consumed by her just sheer, sheer, just pure love for him. Yeah. Well, also that she... Sense and need and dependence. Yes, of a certain kind, and luckily, that 
particular character that Rebecca created has um, has a seed that grows within her of tremendous independence. And in a strange way, in bringing this this sort of ragamuffin family onto the commune, or, um, and and creating this upheaval, right. Jack somehow inadvertently creates, I think, the 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 beginning of a possibility of escape oh, okay. for Okay, let me stay with that because this is an idea we're introducing that the audience doesn't know about. He brings a new person to the dynamic and it upsets everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he brings a family, right. a woman and her two children. Right. Who he doesn't really know and she doesn't know him either. And the daughter doesn't want to give up any of her territory. To her, it's I think it's like a, it's like um, it's an obscenity. It's yeah. that, that that the intrusion into her private world is like a yeah. is a is, an, is a violence. Also, it's a complete betrayal to her because it, it was he, she wasn't warned at all, and she sees it as a as a betrayal that that. That, that he's been seeing this other woman for this period of time without even telling her that suddenly there's a new family. You can see her point. Roll tape. They're not guests. They're moving in. They're guests. That's what we see. Let's just see how it works out. They brought everything. Everything of what? They brought their lamps. I got to admit those lamps were shocking. Well, it's just an experiment, Rosie. Let's just try it for a while and see how it works out. God forbid you might even end up wanting them to you, stay. You tricked me! That was a spur-of-the-moment decision. She's so regular. Kathleen, her name is, by the way. That's the whole point. She'll take care I of things. I took care of no, things. We took care of things. Now I'm sick. How long have you been lying to me? How could you not have told me? I didn't think you'd understand. I don't. Give me the dynamic of working uh, director, well, the dynamic director of, and male lead. It's it was it was seemed, you know, it's hard to even remember exactly what happened, but it seemed to be very effortless and kind of as if we fell into stride together because we talked so much before we got onto the set that we'd really hashed everything out. We were in agreement so that when it came time to um, to actually shoot the film we would have to only say very few words to try different things. It seemed like we were trying different things and, you know, and, and because Daniel was so full, he arrived so full, the character was there, he existed, he was a person. So, um, really, I trusted that and he trusted me then also to photograph that, witness that performance in the way that really revealed the emotion the best. Does a, I mean, could you argue that if you, that Every director and every actor that has been at this table has always said the best thing can happen uh, between a, a actor and a director is trust. Yeah. The, 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 the actor, uh, the, the director trusts the actor to do what they do. Yeah. The actor trusts the director to give me, some, uh, give me something else, yeah. give me more, to, 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 to give me room, give me confidence to be all that I can. Right, exactly. I think that's the principal thing. That's that's the important thing, which, which there was no there was no doubt in my mind. I th the, partly because I'd had the experience of um, of being close by when Rebecca made her film Personal Velocity. So right. I, 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 Three I, I stories had a, are strong. Yes, and and I had a very good idea of the way in which she worked and the way she she worked with people and the way people were around her. But to cr if a, if a director can create that that ground upon which people are able to to take a fall that's all you need really he comes <laughs> prepared I bet like no actor you've ever seen yeah it's really complete I, I think that the, 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 the 
I, I feel that he could answer every single question about a character down to how he pairs his toenails, really. And that's, that's a great gift for a director. It gives you a sense of security. He knows the character cold. Yeah, absolutely, yes. There's really a creation of a character involved, and, uh, and, and that's a, a beautiful thing to watch. It's true. Do you love that? Mm. I do. But talk to me about it. Well, it's a game. It's, it's a game. I, I, um, it's a wonderful game that... Uh, and when you, <clears throat> when you begin to play it, there's nothing, there's no, you don't know where the horizon is. You don't, uh, you don't put fences around it or anything. There's no, it's, li it's the possibilities are limitless and which is a fearful thing in some respects, but as you gather things towards you and try and nourish that little patch of ground and, and feel something growing, it's a, it is, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. It's probably addictive. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's very interesting because as you describe it, I never, never really thought about it. It's very much how I write. I mean, in mm. that I write in a state of into the dark. I don't premeditate. I don't try and preconceive. I, I, I try to let things mature in a fairly organic way. And, of course, then I'm giving Daniel I mean, I give the actor something that's written, but then, then you know, acting, which is always called an interpretive art, really is an act of creation in itself. And it's an interesting, it's, it's, you know, you've done so much work and years and years of writing, but then again, then it's, in the end, it's really only a skeleton. And finally, the actor needs to put flesh on those bones. It's a very, it's interesting to think about it that way. And, and how different actors come to that is an interesting phenom phenomenon. Yes, and they're completely the different. Uh, I mean, I would say one from the other. Actor by actor by yes. actor. You know. And do you understand how you do that? Or do you just do it? Uh, uh, I don't, no, I don't think I do really understand it. Um, I think perhaps it, I enjoy the fact that it remains a, a mystery, even though that makes it always elusive and, and yeah. in some ways very frustrating, but I, I, I love the fact that there's a mystery to it. But going on from what Rebecca was saying, I think, you know, when Rebecca writes, well, <laughs> she, I think she really, f I think she really <clears throat> begins to work through these characters as they, as they um, grow inside of her, so that, and it, and the work always seems to go to be at its best when things happen it seems in spite of you um, as if something just passes through is that is that defined by surprise or something else I mean it happens in spite of you meaning that well, you it get, finds you, its own uh, organic being you can do all the muscular work you can do the obvious things and apply yourself to the details the things you have to learn in rebecca's case the research of a particular period of time or mm -hmm. you know what the the cities where those people came from it can be anything but that remains always a, in a way a, an incidental detail but at some point when things begin to when things begin to grow i think um you have the impression at least, and it's probably a form of self-delusion, but you have the impression that this life begins to pass through you. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and I think she has the same thing. I suspect she does, anyhow. Yeah. She has it first, does she? Well, she has it first, and for that reason, I mean, she does an awful lot of the work for us, because unusually her characters are already alive on the page, and that is very rare. They already have very, very um, tangible very characteristics. Very rare because of her qualities as a screenwriter? Yes, but those qualities come from her, her ability to, to, to inhabit, I think, um, these people that she wants to um, populate her world. Yeah. I mean, it, it was when I, like that scene that you just saw, uh, I cried when I wrote that scene. I mean, you know, you, she was laughing. I was laughing at my own jokes. But I mean, to me, it's like you, you know, it's it's she a kind of it it's kind of it's it's like a it's a kind of possession, I guess, when you mm. write and you give yourself over completely to characters. You have to do that. You have to 
you have to go in there completely, mm -hmm. give yourself over. And are you talking to him when you're writing these characters and shaping them and? Well, you know, the first round, no, because I, you know, we didn't know before, each other. Yeah. Then later, as it as it came, yes, I, I I think I showed you different drafts late late in the game. Um, the I had a the, there was one part of the film which was the last part to really gel for me, which is when they come back to mm -hmm. the to when they go to Marty Rance's house right. and they have that scene between between Jack and Marty Rance, right. the developer. That was a very tough scene to write. It was just hard and. Because it was the fulcrum on which the screenplay turned into its denouement. Right, right. And also so much need to shift inside of Jack. There, and, and in the end, I ended up writing a, a transition which, um, you know, was really difficult. And I think Daniel did so, so beautifully. And everything hinges on this one moment. And uh, it was just... It was just hard to write. Some scenes are hard to write, I think, because it bore so much weight. Tell me how you approached that scene. It's the one with Marcy Rance. Yeah. yeah. Anything special there? Well, certainly there was a... The denouement the, gro the growing mania of a man who's reaching the end of his right. cycle of life, yeah. Yeah. What do you want us to feel about this man? I don't know. Never part of your consciousness? No. No. All that's part of your consciousness is to know what you feel about him. Yeah. Or better yet, know or, yeah. what he feels. Right. Because you become what he feels. As far as possible. You know I'm fascinated by this. <laughs> oh, I love it that you are, too. <laughs> I love it that you are. Well, I am. I know. You know. I know you are. You know, yeah. And yet I respect you as an artist, and I don't want to sort of trample on sort of a creative process that, that's, that's hard. Well, the danger is that you, you know, in talking about it, you, you know, the more I hear myself speak about it, the more it seems to over-mystify something that probably the, is much uh, simpler uh, than it perhaps seems. Perhaps then explain why it's much simpler than that. I mean, but I can't. The trouble is I had, can never arrive at any sort of... Yeah. Description or definition that that seems to well it doesn't satisfy me anyhow. <laughs> it doesn't uh, sound well. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't seem to. It doesn't tell the story. He's different than most actors. <laughs> <laughs> He's special. <laughs> He's different. <laughs> He's different. He is. He is. And that's <clears throat> why he's great. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I think. I think one of the things. That and this is something I noticed, especially when I came to cut the film, is that Daniel is always thinking about. I mean, he's not always thinking in a conscious way, but the choices that he makes within the film are inevitably pushing the whole thing forward. He's he's it's it's a he's storytelling. He's a storyteller, and I think it has something to do with. He's also a very good writer and a, and a great you know very good at. Um, thinking as a writer himself and perhaps that has something to do with it I don't know but it's it's as if although he's very much is in his own world and completely inside of that and concentrated he's also very aware of propelling the story forward making making choices that move you along having the character yes propel the story forward yes he's, he's into understanding how his character moves the story forward because he has a story sense yes yeah right and 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 you know that as a, as the main character in the movie, he has a responsibility. He's 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 carrying the story in a certain way, but it's a it's like a part of him sees from a, a distance, even as he's very far inside. Now, what are you going to do now that you've finished this role? And why do I ask that question? No, it's a, it's it's a it's a it's a pressing matter because we both realize that we can't we've no excuses now by the end of this week we can no longer use this film as an excuse to, to stay together <laughs> <laughs> no no i don't mean stay together in a relationship but it brought you together so you, yeah. you're not off making a movie yeah for marty scorsese you're making yeah. a movie for rebecca miller yeah. right yeah. is that what you mean or something else quite often the question is asked oh is it you know the this thing of letting go is that something gets a hold on you and it, it tends to be presented to you in a way that is the reverse of the reality in that it's not that it's not that 
something gets so far inside of you that it takes a while to kind of disgorge yourself of this 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 alien being that's taken up residence. It's more to do with the fact that, especially in the case of this, where we l loved doing this, we yeah. loved this work, and every because, because of the nature of the story, or because everything of the relationship and everything. Yeah, everything. Particularly just working with Rebecca in the yeah. way we were able to work and, the, and process. the process. And Rebecca allowed me in to be involved in in a, in a very sort of in a much broader way than I'm often allowed to be in. And so the truth is that it's us that are reluctant to let go of it. It's not the yeah. other way around. It's not. Um, it's nothing more. Um, sinister than that, but we just don't want to say goodbye to it, really. The other thing that was nice, I mean, I don't know if you were going to touch on this, but I, one of the things that I think made it a good experience for both of us and really everybody in the cast and crew was that we were able to shoot it in sequence, which Why is did very you do unusual. That? I know you did. Well, I realized I wanted to do it um, quite a while before we, we started shooting. And the reason was, I thought, first of all, this actress is going to be very young. I want her to be able to have a continuous experience of the film. And then uh, I thought, and for Daniel as well, it's really the idea of, of experiencing uh, emotionally what was happening day by day and, and in a line. And also, Daniel changes physically in the film. He, be he loses weight. And that was another reason. But also what happened was I think that all of us kind of, it became, I think everyone in the crew got involved in a different way by watching mm -hmm. it unfold day yeah. by day, mm -hmm. you know? And um, we were also, we also shot the scenes continuously sometimes. So one scene would be connected to another, would be connected to another with two cameras that were sometimes reloading in order to catch it, really to, to be there for these these scenes, these performances that were really, if somebody was running from one room to the next, we were sometimes there with them so we didn't have to cut. Mm. It was, I was trying to reduce the artificiality of filmmaking as much as possible for myself, for the cast in general, for Daniel especially, because I, I knew that it would be a real counterbalance to the way that he has to work mm. much of the time, which is, uh, you know, more artificial. Uh, did you like this? Oh, it's, I'm spoiled. Yeah, I'm spoiled. Because no. you could take the sort of the, uh, to, not to use some fancy word, the arc of the character's evolution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's that's it. It's plain and simple. And uh, as Rebecca said, I think it it was a very small group of people in the crew. So um, everybody had to be involved. There was no nowhere to hide. Everyone was doing something that contributed every moment of every day. And and. It's uh, it, to work with a group of people when you have that shared sense of purpose is would seem to be like a prerequisite for this kind of work, but it often isn't like that. It's just um, not like that. So this is like so one of the was, best movie experiences you've ever had. Yes. Yeah. And and would would you would you try to insist that if it's not some economic disaster or budgetary disaster that that you be able to work like this? I don't think I'm in a position to make those kind of conditions, but uh, certainly if, you could, if we you worked, would. yes, I would. I've worked like that every single time, um, if it were possible to work like that. You yeah. can work like that on the stage. Yes, it's true. That that's true, it, and perhaps it's it brought back a certain sense of freedom where you get to control the time that that the the, the um, dimension of time within which you sculpt what the work that you're doing. Um, uh, and that that's very rarely possible in film, except for brief moments. Does it make you want to go back to the stage? I mean, back. Uh, I wouldn't mind. <laughs> I can see them out there now. <laughs> oh man! Yeah. I wouldn't what, mind. What was the last thing you did? Last thing I did was Hamlet. Where? At the National Theatre in London, and that was how long ago was that? Probably about 20 years ago. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 15 years yeah. at least, anyway. Yeah. 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 Your dad came to the set. He did. He did. In Nova Scotia. Yeah. He came and he watched us shoot the breakfast scene where the whole family has breakfast um, on that first day. And he said, <laughs> he said, it's like everybody, every character is gradually spinning off into chaos. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but he enjoyed it. Oh, he, he loved that. it. He did. Oh, yeah. yeah, he loved it. He loved. It. He got to see the film as well. Yeah. And he really loved it. Oh, he got to see the cut. Yeah, film. he get, he did. Oh, he saw great. the final cut, and um, and he loved it. Yeah. What What's his impact on you as a filmmaker? You think this great dramatist? And I just think it's so hard to say exactly how your parents yeah. have formed you. You know, uh, you know how to subtract them from what else you know mm. would have given you what you are yeah, yeah. Um, um, I think that from both my parents I, I got a real worth work ethic you know I'm a hard worker and I and I and I believe in what I do I think it's a good thing you know I'm not I'm 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 happy to be telling stories and I think that there's 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 something positive about constructing a little bridge of empathy between the viewer and a character whom they may not otherwise have understood or liked or wanted to give the time of day to but somehow perhaps they might in forgive them in a way or understand them and so doing forgive themselves I think there's something very positive about that and I think um, my dad also had an optimistic kind of view of storytelling and also I think probably just technically um, he loved condensation and a kind of utilitarian way of looking at words and language that everything yeah. had to have a purpose and a, and a yeah. you know I remember um, watching a garbage truck with him once he stopped and was staring at this garbage truck and I didn't know I said why are you looking at the, and he said isn't that beautiful and I said, well, it was the kind of garbage truck which it which takes the skip this the skip yeah, like right, you know and right. everything fits in perfectly mm. And he said, well, everything fits. Everything is, has a purpose. And I thought, of course, that's why he liked the garbage that's truck, amazing. because mm -hmm. that's really how he worked. And I, I, and I think that um, in, a, in, a, in a more loose-limbed and, and very different fashion style, um, of a similar aesthetic, but it's, it's you know, it's different. Yeah, it's but my own. And, and storytelling it's, is in the genes. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Does, you got to know Arthur. Yes. Yeah. Um, influence on you? You had a sense of... Yeah. Yeah, big influence. Yeah. Because, it, because you and I know, and we've talked about your dad before, who was a poor mm -hmm. laureate. Yeah. You know, and you didn't have a chance to... Mm -hmm. In later years. Because he died when you were how old? Fourteen. Fourteen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. yeah, Arthur was a very different... Beast, <laughs> the, 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 very the, different the, kind than of. Your dad. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But we are influenced by all of them, you know. Yeah. I mean, you were clearly sure. influenced by yeah. Cecil Day Lewis. Yes. yes. Yeah. When when I look at your film work, um, there is Marty Scorsese, there's Jim Sheridan. Uh, Two films, three for Jim and two for Marty. Yeah. yeah. Are those experiences different when you go back to a director after having worked for them? I mean, you went from Age of Innocence to Gangs of New York. <laughs> yeah. They were as different as those two characters were. Yeah. <laughs> as Bill the Butcher is from. Well, because Martin is so part. He's so he loves to play that game too. So he will his. What my day-to-day -day working relationship with Martin was was very much influenced by the lives of those two people that I was playing. Um, well, he he told me that if he wanted to talk to you on the set of Gangs of New York, he had to talk to Bill Butcher. <laughs> Bill the Butcher. Yeah, I think he preferred talking to Bill than to me. Though. <laughs> How so? It was funnier, I think. <laughs> but. <laughs> you, you know I'm interested in this too, and you know yeah. well, wh why do you stay in character? Maybe it's pure paganism. Paganism. I really don't know. I mean, I. <laughs> uh, I can't say for sure that it necessarily helps me or helps what I'm doing. But I believe that it does. I it's have a strong that, belief that it does, and that's really... That's all that matters. Yeah, that's all that matters. And beyond that, Charlie, I'd say that it's as much to do with, you know, as this, it, this whole thing, the, the beginning of this 
the life of any individual piece of work begins with a compulsion of some kind. Mm -hmm. And Writing, necessarily acting, you share directing. that with the director, otherwise you might as well stay at home. You share, you have a shared sense of, of, um, of urgency to tell that story. And uh, this unleashes a, a, a curiosity that, that is very hard to satisfy. And that curiosity leads you into all kinds of strange and unknown places. And it really seems to me to be part of the pleasure of that work. You, you explore that world, you discover it, you create it to some yeah, extent yourself. Yeah. Why the hell not hang around there for a while? I see, I buy into that totally. Yeah. I really do. Mm -hmm. The Sheridan said about you, I've got to put a restraining order on Jim before you even say anything. Every time he opens his mouth, I have to answer for it for the next ten okay, years. Just no, one. go on. Just one. Yeah, just one. He said <laughs> about you. He said he. Th th I, I don't know. This, I, this doesn't necessarily ring true with me, but he said he, you. He said he hates acting. Yeah, he, that's right. That's his. That's his famous one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and therefore he seeks perfection. Well, I I would hate to think that that is the only reason. I <laughs> The or even any part of the reason yeah. that I seek to try and do things well. It's not... Because you hate it. You, want to see, you, you think you try to do things well because of... He's... Yeah. I suppose he's seen me in a lot of different sort of stages in my life. And uh, he must have seen me uh, at a time when I really felt I was getting nowhere with this work. And so his prevailing sense, unfortunately, of me belongs to that time, but if he cast his mind, cast his mind back, he could remember probably the relish with which I worked under other circumstances with him. So, what, what would that be? Well, with the first, you know, we we made the first film together, and we got it for nothing, rather in the way that, you know, we got this for nothing. In, in other words, all the challenges related to the work itself, and those that's part of the pleasure of the work, but. But sometimes, and it was nothing to do with our working relationship, but we, on the two subsequent um, occasions when we worked, we were working with scripts that were sort of, that were still in progress. They were still kind of being created. This, that, that can be exciting, but it's also tremendously taxing in the wrong kind of way. Because you have to keep stepping outside to look at this thing. And, um, and that kind of, that can be frustrating. But, um, so we didn't, I suppose we both wish to have that first experience all over again. You can't have that. Do you, and do you think he does, because he is the best of his generation, do you, does the process of the creation of a character, do you give a piece of yourself in, in some significant way that that needs rest after the act of creation needs another focus yeah I think so I think so um, but I would have that in common with almost everybody that's engaged in in this kind of work, I mean, on both sides of the camera, that to, to some extent you gather, you learn and fill yourself as full as you possibly can with, um, with this life, this other life. And then for the purpose of the, sh the filming itself, the shooting itself, you're really scooping yourself out. Um, and everybody's doing that in a different way. And I think it does leave you fe feeling uh, depleted. Empty. Yeah, yeah, empty, yeah. And probably that's something to do with what Jim was talking about, too. Because he, I mean, you know, we've seen each other through thick and thin, and he, and it is sometimes, I find those periods of time in the past, I found them very difficult to deal with. Because if you can look at it as like a field that needs to lie fallow for a while, mm. and that there's no possibility of really kind of growing any, anything of any use in it. Or if anything, a different a crop. Of time, a different crop, That's exactly, right. exactly. Mm -hmm. So um, doing something else, some of the creative act is like, a, you know, 
growing another crop in there to exactly. enrich the soil in a different yeah. way. And I think that it just makes common sense, but it's easier said than done, and very often in the aftermath of, of this work, I feel, and, and, I, and I, I know I'm not alone in that, I, I, I feel a great sense of frustration. The work always seems to fall quite far short of what you hoped from it and what you hoped for it. And, and it le it, 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 there's a certain sense of bereavement about it. It's like a, it's a, it's a, it's a different kind of a loss, but there's a certain sense of bereavement about it, I suppose. Mm. You were touched by this, aren't you? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, and I, and you I think... You feel the same way, yeah. don't you? I do, but, you know, for me, when I... It's, the, the stages are sort of different, because when I finish shooting, I immediately have to go into the editing room. So yeah. you start mm -hmm. a whole new thing, right. and it's still new life. In a way, now that the film's really going to open, then finally I'm going to let go. But I think also it's interesting, because I think partly... All, I was thinking about that, about your feeling sometimes when you first see yourself in a film, you think, all that for that, you know, all that... It, 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 to live the life through the eyes of the character, you see everything, experience everything, and then, you know, a film is just taking parts of that, mm. you know, that it's, it's only taking glimpses, really, of a much more total experience, which you're having as an individual, so... Um, I think Jim's point of view probably is that, is that I, he, sees, he feels that I wish that I have too great a hope for this thing that ought to be, that one should have more modest ambitions <laughs> or something. And that's what I mean by paganism. You know, you make a, you know, perhaps I worship I'm, um, some form of idolatry and this is it for me. Um, uh, worship. Well, that this work has because is as is, is 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 the thing that I have faith in. But but then I don't mean that I feel that it is this is salvation of myself or anybody else. But it's it, it, just for its own sake. It's something that I believe in. But of course, with all things you have faith in, that faith is sorely tested at different times. And so there's a kind of constant inter interplay between between that faith and absolute. Um, denigration of that faith, and in Jim's mind, I think he he, he thinks the whole problem stems from the fact that you, that one is trying, that one is looking for too much in something that should that should be more moderated. Is that right? Yeah, maybe. I don't just know. just get on with it and do it or something. But I, I don't I, believe that at all. No, I don't either. <laughs> I think so. But I, don't I don't think, think he, he does either. I don't think he does either. Why get him here, John? Yeah, get, get him, him over. If only we could bring we him, him in, would that be perfect? Let's we'll just beat the beat beat Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> exactly. And make him talk. <laughs> but but I mean, I am struck by the notion that do you think in the end, whether it's Jack or whether it's Bill the Butcher or whether I forget the character in Age of Innocence, what was his name? Newland Archer. Newland Archer, right. Uh, or my left foot. Yeah. Do you feel like in the end you failed to touch where you thought you could? Did, did, does your reach exceed your grasp? Yes, yeah. It does. It does. No matter what anybody says, no matter how good your director says you were, no matter how no, good... I, I just get embarrassed by that. <laughs> No, but that's true. Yeah, he doesn't see that. He doesn't see it. He does, because he set a very know. high standard. And I, don't know what the, I don't know what the reason is. Yeah. It's not, it's not, it, it, I think it would be kind of pretentious of me to, to, say. to suggest in any way that it's because I, you yeah. know, that, that I, I have such unimpeachable standards that I'm always, you know, that's the danger in talking about it in this way. And I, I think it's a lot to do perhaps with the fact that I, I was so unruly and so undisciplined for such a large part of my life that when I finally came to something that really got my attention and made my pulse race a little bit, that I... I that was acting. Uh, yes, and I've been devoted to that thing, but, but there's some... But of course, it, it is bound to let you down. I mean, it's a very, it's a, it's a, mm. it's a very frail mm. form. Even within the performing arts, it ha there's, the, there's, 
it's a frail form. Uh, how yeah. can you not have a yeah. sense of doubt? See, about I it? think you're probably like more, I think more people are probably like him than than not. In a I sense, think so too. I really do. Yeah. I mean, I'm buying yeah. your yeah. idea. I'm sure. Yeah. Is that, I mean, what, and it don't, doesn't have to be a genius. I mean, that people don't feel like that they can reach. I mean, I know people that that don't even want to watch their movies that are very, very, yeah. very yeah. good because yes. they'll see imperfections. Sure. I think that's true. You know, most and, and people, clearly. For, I mean, I, for an artist, a painter, definitely. for a sculpture, everything. for, a, yeah. for yeah. everything. everything. They always know. feel betrayed well, by it in some way. That's as it should yeah. be. Yeah, absolutely. And it's probably that thing which stops you in your tracks initially and then becomes a springboard to do better, mm. to do better the next time, to try and go further into that. Yeah. What's next for you? Do you are you do just I, want to finish this? And then, I'm finishing this. I'm going to write something. Yeah. What's next for you? Do you are you just I, want to finish this and then I'm finishing this. I'm going to write something else for my to to make to direct another film. You only film. want to direct things you write, uh, unless at the moment you know I read scripts. The scripts are sent to me, and I do feel that perhaps the day will come where I say I only want to do things that I write because that's how it's been so far, and that's how it feels. Um, and uh, the next thing I, I want to make is something that I write. There's something I have in my head, and I, I just have to get it out. I've been trying for a few years now, and my good luck has prevented me, in a way, from doing it, because, because. I got to make Personal Velocity, then I got yeah, to right. get it out. I've been trying for a few years now, and my good luck has prevented me, in a way, from doing it, because, because. I got to make Personal Velocity, then I got yeah, to right. make this film. And right. every time, I, I'm really ready to write that thing. So now I'm going to go and really write it, see if it's even there, and then see what happens next. You gonna roll for him? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Well, I don't know yet. He keeps flickering in and out. I don't know who oh, it is. Very good news, sir. <laughs> now, I and you? Well, nothing. Uh, there's, there's something I'm really interested in doing, but, uh, but we're having trouble scraping up the money at the moment. So it may happen this year. I hope it does. Yeah. I do, too. Um, one last story for you. When your dad, your dad spent seven hours of conversation with me, seven different shows, seven hours. Seven shows. different, I'm glad to hear that seven they were not shows. the same No, not show. one time, yeah. <laughs> and this is my great story. And so we, we ran a retrospective about him after his death. But my great, one of my great New York memories is at about 11 o'clock one night, I'm walking down the street, perspective about him after his death. But my great, one of my great New York memories is at about 11 o'clock one night, I'm walking down the street on Park Avenue, near Park Avenue, and he and I pass, and we've done some shows together, so he recognized me. And, and, we say, and we look up, and you can see over a flickering of a television, and there I am, because it's about 11 o'clock, and he said, and he was just, he was just sort of, he, a little bit like watching the dump truck. He was sort of, he just thought, this sort of idea of he and I were talking, hmm. and there, there, over there, hmm. it, we could see in the window somebody watching you could see a flickering image of me watching a show. And he just commented on that, and, and, uh, and I, I walked away thinking, what a great moment mm -hmm. uh, for me mm -hmm. to have known him mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to have had the experience of not only sharing great conversations like this, but also uh, that sort of very special little moment, you know, on a 11 o'clock on mm -hmm. New York Street. Mm -hmm. So thank you for coming. Great to see you. Um, the Ballad of Jack and Rose is in theaters on March 25th. This is a powerful story, a powerful story of a father and a daughter and, and what happens. And, and it is a story about uh, thinking about life's journey and, and where it goes and how it ends. Uh, as always, thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Quite the opposite, <laughs> Charlie. <laughs> thank you. It's always good to see you. You too. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for the hour. See you next time.